There is one question that is lingering out there since the start of the pandemic. And it also includes what you have said as the introduction, Klaus. The question, are our democracies strong and fast enough to face the incredible challenge of COVID-19? Can democracies deliver? Well, I have no doubt. The pandemic has not only demonstrated our democracy's ability to act, it has also shown that democracies are the more powerful, the more resilient, and the more sustainable form of government. I know, of course, that we have not conquered COVID-19 yet. But if we are on our way to finally end this pandemic, it is because we have mRNA vaccines developed by European scientists. And this is thanks to our values that these scientific breakthroughs have been possible. Values such as liberty of research, freedom of science, and the independent choices for investors. And all of this means having the vaccines that we are much better equipped today to fight this virus than two years ago. Let me give you some facts. Europe has delivered a total of over 1.2 billion doses of vaccines to its citizens. Now over 80% of adults in Europe are double vaccinated. But what is even more important, we are the only region in the world that has continued to export or donate to other countries from the beginning and throughout the whole pandemic. A total of 1.6 billion doses made in Europe have been delivered to 150 countries. And with industry producing more than 300 million doses of vaccine every month in Europe, there will be more to come. So these simple facts show that we can trust in democracy to deliver. And this word trust has always been a thread that runs through all editions of the World Economic Forum. Davos has always been about building trust among leaders and uh, most importantly, earning the trust of future generations with responsible leadership. This year, like never before, trust is the most valuable currency when we speak about the state of the world. Trust in science and vaccines can make a difference between life and death. Trust among countries can tilt the balance of international affairs towards cooperation instead of conflict. Trust in functioning societies based on the rule of law channels higher levels of long-term private investment, giving these societies an edge over competitors. And this trust is also essential to all of Europe's main ambitions. Trust, as you said, Klaus, is essential for citizens to embrace the green and digital transformation or to attract young talents. The point is that the recovery, be it in Europe or globally, can only be built on trust and confidence. And this is what I want to talk about today. In the economic and financial crisis a decade ago, member states in the European Union did not entrust the European level with finding a European solution. And as you remember, the result were intergovernmental solutions with deep divisions between member states, mainly North and South. This time, with the pandemic's economic crisis, indeed the 27 member states trusted the European level. With their guarantees, they backed the European Commission to raise capital on the market and to invest it, mainly in our two priorities, the European Green Deal and digitalization. We call this huge recovery program of 800 billion euros, next generation EU. 
And this next generation EU includes by far the largest green bond program ever. We will invest close to 40% of next generation EU in green projects. That's up to 300 billion euros. And so far, all the bonds we issued to finance these investments were heavily oversubscribed. And over one third of our bonds were bought by investors from outside the European Union. This is a clear sign of confidence and trust in Europe from the rest of the world. But of course, I know we must do more. So public investment alone won't work miracles unless they are matched by strong private investments. Europe alone will need to invest an additional 360 billion euros for transforming its energy system every year. That is a staggering figure Yet it is entirely within our reach, but the private sector must come on board and governments have to create the conditions for this to happen. And this is what we have been putting into place, brick by brick by brick. We have now the first ever European climate law, and that ensures that our climate targets are not just an ambition, but a legal obligation. We have now proposed a detailed legal framework that ensures that we can reduce our emissions by at least 55% by 2030. So this is our roadmap for the next decade cast in law. And this provides certainty and trust for investors that if they put their money in clean and climate friendly projects, they can rely on the fact that policymakers will stay the course. Or take the critical sector of semiconductors. Demand for them is skyrocketing. Today, we have microchips not only in our PCs and smartphones, but also in our cars and the heating system of our homes, in our hospitals, in the life-saving ventilators. There is no digital without chips. And the European need for chips will double in the next decade. And this is why we need to radically raise Europe's game on the development, production and use of this key technology. Europe is strong in some specific areas, such as, for example, the design of components for power electronics or chips for the automotive and manufacturing industries. Europe is the world's center for semiconductor research. And Europe is also very well positioned in terms of the materials and equipment that are needed to run large chip manufacturing plants. But Europe's global semiconductors market share is only 10%. And today, most of our supplies come from a handful of producers outside Europe. And this is a dependency and uncertainty we simply cannot afford. So by 2030, 20% of the world's microchips production should be in Europe. And keep in mind that the world's production itself will double. So this means quadrupling today's European production. We have no time to lose. And this is why I can announce here today that we will propose our European Chips Act in early February. What does it do? It will help us to make progress across five areas. First, we will strengthen our world-class research and innovation capacity in Europe. Second, we will focus on ensuring European leadership in design and manufacturing. Thirdly, we will, and this is important, further adapt our state aid rules, of course, under a set of strict conditions. But this will allow public support for the very first time for European first-of-a-kind production facilities. So that benefit all of Europe. 
Fourthly, we will improve our toolbox box to anticipate and respond to shortages and crises in this sector, to shore up our security of supply, so to be better prepared. And fifth and finally, of course, we will support smaller innovative companies in accessing advanced skills, industrial partners, and equity finance. It's a whole big program, this European CHIPS Act. But I also want to be clear in this community. Europe will always work to keep global markets open and connected. This is in the world's interest and it's in our own interest. But we also need to tackle the bottlenecks that slow down our own growth. Because this will help us become a stronger player, not just in some niche, but throughout the whole value chain. And it is important for us. So to conclude, we will promote diversification among like-minded partners. We will create more balanced interdependencies. And we will build supply chains we can trust by avoiding single, single points of failure. The point is that there will always be times when we need to address wider issues in our economies. And look, let me look at the second one. Today's global energy pressure is a case in point. We will soon mark 50 years since the start of the oil crisis in the 1970s. And I guess some of us will remember vividly the impact of the crisis on our economy, but also on our lives. I remember being on a bicycle on the Autobahn. Some countries banned indeed the driving on Sundays to set lower speed limits on the motorways. Others rationed gasoline or told people to heat only one room in the house. And many of you know the debates it caused on the limits of growth. Now, the world is a different place today, and parallels can seem a bit tenuous. But there is a cautionary tale for us as we face today's gas crisis, and as we have our own debates on the limits of fossil fuel growth. At the time, our response was not to look at alternative sources of energy but rather to look at alternative, uh, at alternative sources of production. So oil exploration spread far and wide from Alaska to Siberia, from the Caspian Sea to the Caucasus. The good news is that we have far more options at our disposal today than we did back then. Back then, less than 1% of electricity was generated from renewable sources worldwide. Today, this figure has jumped up to close to one-third. Today, we know much more about the climate imperative. And today, we have the technologies we need to make the transition from a fossil fuel system to a clean energy system. In the short term, we have to address the very real impact this gas crisis is having on households and businesses. My commission has put forward a toolbox of measures that member states are using to rapidly mitigate the impact of price rises. But fundamentally, today's gas crisis must serve to accelerate the transition to clean energy. It must provide the impetus we need to further integrate our energy market. And we must ensure that there are no energy islands or regions of Europe that are cut off from our network. We are working on all these points, but most importantly, we have to manage this necessary transition carefully. And this comes back to this central question of trust. Because people 
need to trust that the transition will support the most vulnerable. Businesses need to trust that the transition will improve their competitiveness. And investors need to trust that we will stay the course whenever there are bumps on the road. There will never be a linear shift from a fossil fuel-based system to the clean energy system. We must be upfront about that. But the direction is clear, and so is our commitment. As we respond to this gas crisis, we will focus on protecting those most affected, we will accelerate the transition, and we will ensure that we have the reliable suppliers we need. And this leads me to my last point. That is trust in the international arena. At this moment in time, the world needs trust in democracy as much as between democracies. Because tragically, we are once again faced with the interference of some powers in the neighbor's affairs. We will not go back to the old logic of competition and spheres of influence, where entire countries were treated as possessions or backyards. We have intense days of diplomacy in different formats with and without Russia. Russia has made its proposals, we made our proposals, and it is good that we engage in dialogue. But we do not accept Russia's attempts to divide Europe into spheres of influence. For us, the fundamental principles underpinning European security remain valid in the Helsinki Final Act and the Paris Charter, both signed by Russia. And we reaffirm our solidarity with Ukraine and our European partners that are threatened by Russia. And of course, we continue to stand behind the fundamental principle that Ukraine is free to decide as a sovereign state. To be very clear, we want this dialogue. We want conflicts to be solved in the bodies that have been formed for this purpose. But if the situation deteriorates, if there are any further attacks on the territorial integrity of Ukraine, we will respond with massive economic and financial sanctions. The transatlantic community stands firm on this. The European Union is by far Russia's biggest trading partner and by far the largest investor. And yes, this trading relationship is important to us, but it is far more important to Russia. We hope an attack won't happen, but if it does, we are prepared. And what I want us never to forget is the following. Russia and Europe share geography, culture, history. We also want a common future. Our difficulties are not with Russia or with its, its people. Our difficulties are with the dangerous policies of the Kremlin. It is the reenactment of familiar patterns of autocratic behavior that underscores the old truth. Where trust is lacking, force and coercion cannot replace it. And Europe's approach is completely different. We believe that trust and confidence are more sustainable than control and coercion. It is the attractiveness of our liberal democracies that the autocrats fear. Our economic success, our civil liberties, and the freedom of speech and ideas. We must step up to defend these most valuable treasures of our democracies. Again, thanks for having me, dear Klaus, 
ladies and gentlemen. And now I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Madam.